Is that any better? There we go. All right. My name's Wayne Walters, and I'm glad to be here today. Uh, I got uh, elected for this job because I work with um, a Herald, and um, so we we spent a lot of time together. And uh, he said you were looking for a pastor and needed some pulpit fill, and asked me if I was willing. I'm always willing. Amen. It's showing me a preacher that's not willing to preach, and uh, something wrong. So we're going to start with a song this morning, number. 296. say Psalm 129, but it's Psalm 29 if you have your Bible. That's where we're going to be in just a few moments. So let's bow our heads for prayer and ask the Lord to meet with us this morning. Our Heavenly Father, oh my, here it is, the week of Thanksgiving. And though we have a Thanksgiving service coming up Thursday, we are still amazed at how we can't help but be thankful, full of gratitude every Sunday, every day, as we think of how wonderful you are to us. I often, Lord, think that if you would have said, okay, I will save you from hell because you believe in me, however, when you die, you will just cease to exist, just like an animal. We would have gotten a good deal. That would have been a much better deal than having to go to hell forever. And yet you didn't do that. You loved us so much that you said, I want to spend eternity with you. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am there you may be also. How do, we, how do we even comprehend such love? We can't. We can't comprehend not only the sufferings of Jesus Christ on Calvary, but the suffering of God the Father watching his own sons go through that. We can't comprehend what it must be like for the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, whose name is the Comforter, had to stand back with hands off and not be allowed to comfort. Oh my, we're a grateful people. I hope we are. It ought to help us live a dedicated life when we think of how much you love us and what you've done for us. So we're very, very thankful this morning to be here where we can worship together with others that love you. And we ask that you'll meet with us. Lord, I have a sermon prepared. I'd throw it in the garbage in a heartbeat if I thought you wanted me to do something else. And I pray that you'll control my mind that I'll say whatever you want me to say this morning. I'm not concerned so much if people are impressed with the message, but I sure want people to be helped and blessed. And I pray they will be, that this will be a profitable time for the kingdom of God as we spend it together. We ask it in Jesus' name. 
Amen. All right, you may be seated. I'm reading from Psalm 29. I love the psalm. Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars. Yea, the Lord breaketh the cedars of Lebanon. He maketh them also to skip like a calf. Lebanon and Syrian like a young unicorn. The voice of the Lord divideth the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shaketh the wilderness. The Lord shaketh the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord maketh the hinds to calve and discovereth the forests. In his temple doth every one speak of his glory. I love that. The Lord sitteth upon the flood. Yea, the Lord sitteth king forever. The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Verse 2, I'm going to repeat again. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Our next song is uh, number 322.
be seated. Wow. Boy, that's good singing, good music, wasn't it? Oh, man, that does something to me. That was wonderful. Just a couple of quick announcements. Um, uh, I guess there's illness in the T. Meyer family, so they're not here today. They're going to uh, share a little bit about their calling and their ministry with Wycliffe. But uh, that's put off now. And we were going to have a dinner today after the service and uh, uh, spend time with them, get to know them. But that's kind of put off. And um, so that'll be on December 5th. That, that'll be rescheduled for December 5th. So you know that. And I'm sure you probably know we're planning on getting together. And I'll be here uh, on Thanksgiving Day. Uh, I'm wanting that to be a special day. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you a story. It's almost the whole message is a story, a very unique story. And uh, there's a purpose for it. At the end of the story, we're going to apply that to all of us. And so I hope you'll be here. And that's, of course, 930 on Thursday morning. And so looking forward to that. Okay. Well, I don't know the people on your prayer list, obviously. This is my first time here. But there's several, several people in need of prayer right now. And they are in your, on your prayer sheet in your bulletin. And there's also a one handed to me this morning. It says, please pray for God's peace and presence for Sean and Hillary Cameron. Uh, I'm sorry? Close enough? Close enough? All right. Uh, Joan Cameron and Bill and Bonnie. Yeah. Snook's grandson and wife, they are being detained in Mexico because Hillary has come down with COVID. Oh, brother. Isn't this, stuff, isn't this COVID amazing? My word, it's changed everybody's life dramatically in so many ways. And, uh, and, and it's strange. Um, we know of people in their 70s and 80s that get COVID and hardly sick. And I'm thinking of a man right now who I know of, 47 years old, healthy as can be, a police officer in Rockford, vaccinated, got it and died. You know, I just... We hear of people who, a couple, they sleep in the same bed, live in the same house. One of them gets it, one of them doesn't. Uh, I had it. I got it real bad. I was 14 days in intensive care at the hospital. Four of those days, the first four days, just hanging in balance between life and death. And uh, uh, it was scary. And so... Um, Somebody said, did you think you'd die? No. Why not? Because God gives grace for dying, and I didn't have it. <laughs> so it must not have been my time. All right, well, let's go to uh, Lord in prayer for these folks. Our Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to come to you in prayer. To think that you care about what matters to us. To think that the God who created the entire universe and has to control everything notices when a sparrow falls. Knows the number of hairs on our head. Not just knows how many, but they're each numbered. So this morning when I brushed my hair and a few came out, you knew what numbers they were. You're an almighty God. You're a holy God. And your love for us, not only to, as we mentioned earlier, to pay the price for our sins with your own son's precious blood, but to even be concerned with what we're concerned with. You invite us, in fact, instruct us to pray to bring our request to you. You tell us not to be anxious for anything, 
but in everything by prayer and with thanksgiving, let your, our request be made known unto you and promise that if we do the peace of God that passes all understanding, we'll keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. What an amazing God. We're humbled to think that Almighty God has that much love for sinful man. We bring you our prayer request this morning. We're thinking of these folks who plan on coming home maybe for the holidays, for Thanksgiving, and now they're detained because of COVID. Oh, God. COVID has been, in a way, a curse on all of us, and yet we wonder if it isn't part of the judgment of God upon our nation and even our world because we've forgotten him, forsaken him, deny him. And yet there's peace even in COVID for the Christian knowing that nothing can happen to us unless it's ordained of you. Even if we lose somebody we love, though there's grief and sorrow, we don't sorrow as those that have no hope because the peace of God that passes all understanding, because the comforter, does his job of comforting us and because of the hope that we have of heaven because of the promises of God. And so we're so thankful for that. We're so thankful that even in time in our world like we haven't seen in our lifetime where there's plagues and suffering and wars and rumors of wars that during this time the Christian can have joy and peace. Father, there's a lot of names on here on this prayer list, and I'm sure each and every one of them are, are serious, at least they are to them and should be to us. God, I don't know them, but I don't need to know them because I couldn't help them if I wanted to. Oh, God, you know them. You know every detail in their life every detail in their heart, every situation they face, every fear they have, every bit of suffering they go through, every tear they shed. You record their tears in a, your book and catch them in your tear bottle, the Bible says. What a God, what love that you'd even save our tears and know why we cried them. And so we find it very easy to commit these folks to you. To me, their names on paper, to you, they're people that you love and are precious to you. And I pray that you'll give comfort where comfort's needed, healing where healing is needed. Peace for the one who's at unrest today. Someone out there doesn't know where to turn, what to do. They can't see down the road of what's going to happen in their lives and it's very concerning to them. But you know. Help them to remember they're in your hand. That you guide them, direct them, give them wisdom. Oh God, we don't know. There's people in this room today might not be alive by Thanksgiving Day, at least here on earth. Our times are in your hands. And so as we not only commit these on the prayer list to you and ask for your graciousness and mercy and compassion and healing and help, but we commit ourselves to you we are needy people. How wonderful to have a God that knows and cares, who's not only able 
to answer our prayers, but is willing, willing and able. What a God. We worship you today. Our hearts are overwhelmed when we think of the greatness of God and of his great love to us. I pray that you will help us now to take the next few moments and focus directly on what you have for us. I mean, we got up this morning, we got dressed, we bathed and, and got in our cars and came here. We might as well get something while we're here. And God, that's your will, that's your plan. The problem wouldn't be with you, it would be with us. Help us to not let our minds wander, but to focus. What does God have for me today? That we would leave here a better people as a result. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. All right. Well, and since Jan July 24th, I have preached every Sunday except the last two. And every church has a different order of service. And so if you see me looking at this thing a lot, um, I don't want to overlook something and get out of a kilter. Did you know that uh, you won't even listen to anything I say today if I miss one thing in the order of service? And, uh, and I'm sure you're not really that way, but... Uh, I'm cons always concerned about that. Want to do it your way, and um, so at this time we're going to take up our offering, and it'll go for our general fund and ministry shares. Amen. Boy, that's beautiful, wasn't it? All right. Well, our scripture is Isaiah chapter 46. It's only a short passage because I'm going to turn to another one in just a few moments. 
And, uh, but we're going to start with this one, Isaiah chapter 46. You probably saw the title as God's promises to the elderly, but listen to me. You, uh, if you're the youngest person in this room with comprehension, in other words, not this little baby over here, probably not going to get much out of the message today. But uh, if you're even five, six years old, these would be good promises for you for all of your life. Isaiah 46, verse 3. Hearken unto me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel, which are born by me from the belly, which are carried from the womb. And even to your old age, I am he, and even to the whore hairs will I carry you. I have made you. I will bear, even I will carry and will deliver you. To whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we may be like? This is the word of the Lord. Father, the next few moments, as I mentioned a moment ago, we need to focus on what you have for us. We're wasting our time to get ready and drive here and sit here today if we're not going to give our hearts to you, our, not only our mind and attention so we can hear but may we be willing to accept whatever you give us today. Today, we're not challenging anybody like we will next time. But we need these promises because there's going to come times in our life of uncertainty. And especially for those who are up in years and they feel their life is hardly worth living. And yet you have a purpose for them, otherwise they wouldn't be here. And so I pray that you would help everyone here to learn these truths, that the Holy Spirit of God may bring them to our remembrance in our time of need. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. I'd like you to take your Bible also, if you've got it, and turn to Psalm 73. If you don't have it, you can listen real closely. Psalm 73. Psalm 73 is a very interesting passage. By the way, while I'm turning here, why don't I do this? I, I think you relate to a pastor better if you know a little bit about him. My wife, Denise, is down here. Wave your hand, Denise. And uh, we're newlyweds. We've been married 48 and a half years. And uh, I was 17 years old and still in high school when we got married. People said it'll never work. They might be right, but so far, we're okay. Uh, I was going into the Navy and didn't want to I was afraid that if I got, went in the Navy and wrote my uh, love letters back to her, she'd marry the mailman. And so I, I said, I'm not going to take that chance. I'm going to marry her before I go in. So we got married uh, the end of April. She had graduated the year before. And I uh, graduated June 6th. And so um, we, uh, we've caused a lot of trouble in life. We have 21 grandchildren. We have three great-grandchildren. We're old. Most of them will be at our house this Thanksgiving. We have a son who lives in St. Louis and a daughter married to a preacher uh, in Minneapolis area, and they cannot make it this year. But there will be around 20 of us uh, at the table this Thursday. And so... Uh, we grew up in Michigan. I was born in Kalamazoo. Um, but 
moved away from there before I was two years old and uh, grew up in the Grand Rapids area. My wife is from Sparta, and I'm from a little town called Marne and went to school in Coopersville. So we're, we're from western Michigan, southwest Michigan, and uh, we call this our home. We've been all over the place with ministry and the, and the military, but um, uh, Michigan is our home. All right. In Psalm 73, very interesting situation here. The psalm is not a psalm of David like we always assume. It was written by a song, a famous songwriter named Asaph. And Asaph was very human like you and I. Because in Psalm 73, he's complaining. He's griping to God. You ever done that? Don't want to admit it, do we? But he did. You see, uh, in fact, look at verse 2. It says, but as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped, for I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And he goes on for the next several verses to talk about it just doesn't seem fair. I love God, and I pray, and I serve him, and I trust him, and yet there's people out there that are heathen, and they got it better than I do. What's the deal with that? I remember one time, my wife and I going by down the road, and we passed this beautiful, beautiful house. And she says, oh, it's so beautiful. And I knew we'd probably never have anything like that. And I said, let them have it. That might be all they ever have to enjoy if they don't know God. Amen. I got a mansion coming that'll make that place look like a shack. And uh, it's careful. We got to be careful not to be envious and not, not feeling that we've been treated unfairly of God if some of the heathen have good things. The Bible teaches the goodness of God leads us to repentance and I think many times God blesses the heathen just in hopes that they'll be thankful and trust him. But anyway, Seth was complaining and then all of a sudden he realizes how foolish it was. Look at verse 17 if you have it. It says, uh, until he's complaining, these are my thoughts. In fact, verse 16, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. See his anguish? It was too painful for me. I couldn't handle it until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood I their end. You know why you ought to be faithful to church? When he came to church, what happened? You remember, there? well, you young people only know what I'm going to talk about here, but some of you are as old as me. You remember our old TV set. Sometimes they would just be all fuzzy. You couldn't see anything, and there's a button on there you could press. It was called reset, and boom, everything came into focus the way it's supposed to. And that's what happens many times you come to church. We're out there in the world and see so many things that just it, it, it causes the things of God to be blurry and fuzzy. And like Asaph, he goes into the sanctuary, gets back in God's, with God's people, hearing God's word, and it's like setting that reset button and boom, things come back into focus. And during that time, when things finally came into right focus for him, God gave him some interesting thoughts. And those are the ones I want to use this morning with the last passage. In Psalm 73, verse 22, it says, So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast hold me by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel. And afterward, 
receive me to glory. Now, we're going to put those scriptures together, the thoughts of both those scriptures together, next few moments. I'm here to tell you, if you are elderly, God has not forgotten you. He knows you. When did he start to know you? It's very clear in Jeremiah chapter 1 that before you were formed in the womb. You notice that? It doesn't say before you're born. It says before you were formed, before you had arms and legs, before the heart even started to beat, before you're, you even started to resemble a human being, before you were formed, God knew you. Amen. And he had a plan for your life. For It goes on in Jeremiah to say that Jeremiah, uh, God knew Jeremiah and ordained him to be a prophet to the nations. Well, maybe God didn't ordain you or me to be a prophet to the nations, but he ordained something for you. He had a plan for your life before you were even formed. By the way, that pretty well does away with the abortion argument, doesn't it? Well, it's not really a person. Oh, yeah, God knew that person before they were formed, had a plan for their life. Man might come in and change that plan through murder. But they can't justify it. It's murder. It's sin. So it goes on and says, I, I've known you since before you were formed in the womb. I know you, I know where you are. I know your worries, your fears. How do we know that from the scripture? Because he says, I pr he promises he will bear you up. That means he'll give you strength. He says, I will carry you. Now, something about that made me want to study it a little further. So I looked it up. And I, I, I'm glad I did. Because the suggestion here, when God says he'll carry you in the scripture, is that he will coddle you or cuddle you as a mother does her little child. He goes on to say here, I'll deliver you. That means when you're facing things that Worry you, concern you, at times of trouble. God says, don't worry, I know about it. It's not a surprise to me. I know what's going to happen. I've chosen for my reasons to allow it. Would you hold on to that thought for a moment? Whatever you're facing, God chose to, for you to allow to you, yourself to go through that. Why? For his glory? Maybe. To strengthen you? Maybe. Maybe that you might see how he delivers you so that you will trust him more. You can't testify to others about him till you learn to trust him and have experienced things. He says he'll meet all your needs according to his riches and glory. And then when the time is right, when the time is right, he'll receive you into glory. Now I want to say, yeah, by the way, I'm, I'll, I'll, uh, let me interject this and you'll understand kind of why I'm coming in this direction today. How many of you ever heard of Sunset Manor? I hear you have people from your church that now live in Sunset Manor. Is that right? Who, who here has family in Sunset Manor? Okay, I'm a chaplain there. I'm not the permanent chaplain. In fact, the last chaplain I had was somebody most of you probably know from this area, Mark Miniger. And uh, Mark and I became friends. It was, uh, it's funny that um, Mark 
and I were in the military at the, went in the same exact month, got out the same exact month. We're, we had similar jobs. We were in the military. We both became Christians in the Navy. So we're so much alike. And I'll be honest with you, I am not a Christian Reformed minister. I was raised part-time in the Christian Reformed Church because my dad was Christian Reformed, but my mother was Lutheran. They couldn't agree in a church, so nobody went. And a Baptist church came along with a bus and said, would you like a ride? I said, sure. But Mark Miniger, when he would go on vacation, would ask me, not any of the Christian reform ministers in that area, but me, to come and take his place. And because he knew that I love elderly people. In fact, I've asked God to give me wisdom what to say. I wasn't planning to say this, so I'm going to say it. When I was a little boy, there was nobody in our area my age to play with. We lived out in the country. It was a quarter of a mile to the nearest neighbor. Lived on dirt roads west of Marne, a few miles west of the Berlin Raceway. And so I'd get bored. I'd want something to do. I found something to do, something I loved doing. I would get on my bike, and I would ride down the road and visit the elderly people in our area. I'm talking when I was 8, 9, 10 years old, 11. I loved to hear their stories. They seemed to love to have me visit them. They even laughed at my jokes. Hardly anybody does that. And they always had cookies. Maybe that's the reason I went. I'm here to tell you, God did that to me as a child. I had no idea what God was doing, but he was doing that to prepare me to be able to go to sunset and minister with a heart of love to the elderly people. And I love elderly people. <laughs> Especially one, I'm married to her. Um, I, didn't, I, didn't, I knew I'd get old. I just didn't think it'd happen this fast. But uh, so I want to tell you, Something I tell them even in the nursing homes and retirement homes. God still has a purpose for you being here. Now, I say it sometimes only people, and it's like, <laughs> yeah, what? Maybe your family is not ready to lose you yet. Did you ever stop to think? the influence that you could have over your grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Just a few minutes ago, we talked about going through things in life. We don't understand why we have to go through them. But remember, once you've been through things and seen the hand of God keep you and deliver you in your life, what a testimony to your children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren of the things of God in your life. I challenge you to teach them that there's a God who cares for them and will care, take care of them if they will just trust him. To them, you're old. And they can hear you tell them that God has kept you the whole way. See, you may tell personal stories of things that you went through that God has carried you through. What better testimony of the things of God than listening to your grandparent? 
who you love share how God has worked in their life. Do your best to encourage others. Teach others. Testify of God's goodness to you. And of course, the obvious one, you have more time now that you can pray for others. You know, this prayer list, I didn't spend a whole lot of time. I don't know these people. I don't, even if I see a little bit about what their situation is, I don't understand exactly what they're going through. You do. What an opportunity for you in your retirement years to pray for these people more than somebody who would love to pray for them and is concerned about them but has to go to a job every day. Others need to learn what you've learned about God and his care. No one can convince them more than an elderly person who's experienced and seen the work of God in their life. And then when the time comes, God, Asus said, then you receive me into glory. Now, let's talk about that a little bit. We want to sound like good Christians and say we're all ready, but is there fear? Sure there is. Anything that's unknown is fearful. But I want to share with you something that maybe you never thought of before. Maybe you have. If you have, you need to be reminded. And that is... I don't want you to look at your death from your point of view. I want you to look at death from God's point of view. Listen to this. Psalm 116, verse 15. Precious. What a word. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. <laughs> Precious. What we look at as horrible and the last enemy to be destroyed According to the Bible, to him is precious. Say, why is that? Doesn't he know that we're separated from people we love? People who grieve our, our, our departure? Yeah. How does he look at it as something precious? Well, let me help you with that a little bit today. You see, Jesus is excited for you to meet him personally. To see him face to face. And here's why. Think about it. Think about it from the point of view. Jesus is saying, you trusted me, but you never saw me. You prayed to me. Through faith. But you never really had proof that I existed. You never saw me. You never heard my voice. You lived for me. You were faithful to church and to worship me. And you served me. All these years, you served me though you could not even see me or hear my voice. You did it through faith. And today, <laughs> I receive you and you get to see the one who saved you, the one you trusted, the one you served. And I get to reveal myself to you. How precious is that? How sweet heaven will be. Yes, we'll see Jesus, but we also be reunited with friends and family. I want to see some people that are there that I miss. Amen. You have family, 
Okay, a little unorthodox here, but I, I'm just wondering. I wonder if anyone here has a child that's in heaven. Anyone? Oh, my. You see, the reason I bring that up, I, I've, done, I've probably done 150 funerals in my time. I've seen people grieve the loss of spouses, parents, grandparents, brothers and sisters, siblings. But the worst, most, the th one that impacted me the most is when I had a funeral for a 55-year-old woman. She died of cancer. Her 82-year-old mother grieved. And in my mind, I thought, well, come on now. I mean, sure, you miss her, but. And then she said something that grabbed my heart. She said, you're not supposed to bury your children. They're supposed to bury you. It caused me for several days to think about it, to think about what it would be like to lose one of my own children. They're married. They're gone. They got their own lives. And yet I would be grieved beyond anything I can imagine to lose my children. God bless you folks. You've lost your children. But thank God you'll see him again. Amen. We'll see friends, family, loved ones, parents, siblings. But that's, and we'll see all those people we read about in the Bible. Gideon and Abraham and Jacob. All the Bible characters. We'll meet them. They're real. They're there. Get to hear David talk about how he slew Goliath. But I want to throw out another verse to you. I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither has it entered in the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them. <laughs> you know, there's not a lot in the Bible talking about heaven. There's some in Revelation, but we can't picture that. Even when we read it, we can't picture 12 gates of pearl. Each gate is one pearl. Golden streets. I can't picture golden streets. Pure gold. When it talks about the throne of God and how majestic it is, I, I can't imagine that. And, and, and I heard something one time that just impressed me so much. A missionary who had spent years in the jungles of Africa in the bush was telling how after being there a number of years and, and, and developing a really wonderful, sweet relationship with the people there in the jungle, they asked him about his native land where he was from. And so he tried to tell them. He said, well, we don't have these dirt roads. We've got pavement. And they said, what's pavement? Well, you, you, you wouldn't understand. But, you, you know, you've got these grass huts we have skyscrapers made out of concrete with glass windows and they said what's concrete what, 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 what do you mean glass what windows he soon became frustrated that there was nothing he could do to describe where America to these people because they've never seen anything like that before. They can't understand it. And that's the way heaven is. This verse isn't limited to talking about heaven, but I guarantee it includes heaven. We can't comprehend heaven because we've never seen any place like that before. We've never even heard of any place like that before. And when it says, neither has it entered in the hearts of man, it means simply this. You can't even imagine anything that glorious. Huh. 
That's what you got to look forward to. So don't look at death the same way. Look at it from the eyes of Jesus Christ who reveals himself to you and it's precious to him. And to be able to go to a wonderful place you can't even comprehend. To live forever. (laughs) Uh, You know what? I'm going to finish and close with something real special here. You've heard the verses. It's right after the great white throne judgment of God. The very next thing the Bible talks about. John said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there's no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Now listen to this part. This is what I wanted to get you to get. And he, God, will dwell with them. And they shall be his people. And then he repeats it like this. God himself shall be with them and be their God. God says, I'm not just going to save you from hell. I'm going to prepare a place for you, and I want to be there with you. And God himself will dwell with us forever. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, Neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away. You know, and I jokingly said at the beginning, I look down at this thing because I don't want to miss anything and, and get you mad at me. Guess what I forgot? The reading of the Ten Commandments. I've used up your time. Can we do that Thursday instead? Would you, would you allow me to do that? And uh, I don't want to get you out of church late either. Let's ask, let's bow our heads and, and thank God for the truth we heard this morning. Father in heaven, it was easy for me at the beginning of this message to praise you and worship you and talk about your love for us and now these folks got an idea of why I felt that way because I knew the message that they hadn't heard yet because I knew in just a few moments we would be totally reminded of the wonderful love of God and see how great that love is that from the very beginning when we were conceived in the womb, before our mothers knew they were even pregnant, you knew us, planned out our life, cared for us every step of the way, delivered us through problems, carried and coddled us through life, met all of our needs, used us and then when the time was right or when the time will be right and then and only then you will receive us in the glory and yet that's not the end because at that point We have the rest of eternity to enjoy not only the things of God and the people of God 
and the beauty of heaven, but to be able to dwell with God himself. We stand amazed today at the wonderful, glorious love of God. Father, I pray that these thoughts from this message will help us through the times of troubles and as we face the uncertainty in our latter years when we even wonder why you still allow us to breathe air. Oh God, we ask that you will bring these things to our remembrance. In Christ's name, amen. Number 408 in your songbook, How Firm a Foundation. I did not pick the song to go with a message, but that song sure went well with that message, didn't it? Wow, tremendous. Well, now the Lord bless thee and keep thee. Lord, make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord, lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen.